Okay, so uh, first things first, uh, you will be able to find the deck I'm using um, in the handouts uh, section of the sidebar, so you can download it right now if you want to. Additionally, I will be mailing it out to everyone who registered, so you'll be receiving it regardless. Uh, and it will also be made available on our website, so there are various different ways you can get access to, to, to the slides. Um, our next webinar uh, will be Tuesday. Uh, typically our webinar is on Wednesday, so this will, will be on Tuesday, October 3rd, uh, and it will be on uh, medical device non dilutive funding, uh, trends and opportunities. And, and I'm uh, sharing a link to register to that webinar in the chat right now. Uh, so you can follow that and register at this time. Um, additionally, um, if you have any questions during the webinar, feel free to type them in. in the, there, there's a, a questions section in the sidebar as well. Uh, and I'll try to address as many of them as I can towards the end of the talk. Um, and this is being recorded and will be on our YouTube page, so you'll also be able to either view it on YouTube or share it with anybody you think may have interest in this. Uh, all that out of the way, and let's get started. Um, so non dilutive funding for uh, the nervous system, the CNS, PNS related R&D. Um, and basically, a little bit of a background in terms of who's speaking with you today. So the Fremont Group is a consultancy. We have our, well, any type of life science organization, academic industry, all the way up from tiny seed stage startups and to some of the largest companies out there. Um, we help our clients raise funding from non dilutive sources. Um, 60 full time employees. Uh, we submit about 500 applications a year. Uh, and, and this is the only thing we do. So it, it's a firm that's focused solely on. Uh, strategizing, applying to, and winning awards from these sources. Um, and basically, we view ourselves as a tool uh, that can be used to maximize uh, a company or an organization's potential for non dilutive funding. Uh, and that basically starts with identifying the most relevant sources of funding, strategizing on how to approach them, how to present your science, and how to make it adhere to what they're looking for, uh, managing complex uh, project production processes. Um, we lead also the actual uh, joint application writing process. We support uh, contract negotiations and anything like that when it's relevant. Uh, and, and basically, um, we help you make non dilutive funding a true strategic financial tool for your organization. Um, in terms of the general pocket of money that's out there, uh, looking specifically at this point uh, at the NIH, and we'll be discussing a few non-NIH sources of funding today as well, but uh, by far the NIH is the largest source of funding. Um, and their third, currently $34 billion budget next year uh, is going to be increased as well after the kind of scare that we had with, with uh, it may have been going in the other direction, but it's, it will be increased, which is fantastic. Um, out of that, just about 28 is actually going outside of the NIH to fund uh, research, extramural research. Um, in terms of the areas of research that that covers, and this is these, um, if you add these up, it will not come to the total. These are not uh, um, basically mutually exclusive. So something can, as an example, be both, uh, an award can be counted both as clinical research and as neuroscientists. As, as, just as an example here, but generally speaking, it gives you a good understanding of how much money is going to each area of research, uh, and not necessarily, as I mentioned, just kind of summing this up into the total budget. Um, but just to give you kind of an understanding, there is a very long tail on this graph, and basically, I think one of the most important things to understand here is there's there's money out there pretty much for anything, uh, and, and more importantly, in terms of what we are discussing today, one of the highest areas of funding is neurosciences, uh, $6 billion a year with a B. That is a huge pocket of money. Um, and definitely not something that should be neglected. Now looking specifically within the NIH to what is not the only, by the way, uh, NIH institute that funds neurosciences related research because you have the, 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 the NIMH and the NIDA, the NIA, but by far the agency that funds the most of this type of research 
is the NINDS, the National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke. Um, and I kind of broke down their funding mechanisms into four, even though not all of the relevant funding mechanisms fall within one of these four categories. Uh, but I think this is kind of a very um, effective way of, of uh, basically kind of portraying what they have to offer. Um, so basically it starts with in a, the IGNITE program, which is uh, for very early stage projects, not basic science, but initial translational efforts as they describe it, meaning basically anything that's being at the beginning of the process of being translated into something that's actually uh, applicable. Um, not many companies go any earlier th than this in terms of research anyway. Um, and there are a few different programs, uh, or rather uh, opportunities within each one of these, but I'll kind of give you the quick overview before we go into that. Uh, the second two, the second and third one, but they're kind of similar in terms of what they cover, uh, Create Bio and BPN. Uh, the main difference, and both of these are from slightly more advanced projects that are maybe uh, early preclinical or something kind of in that vicinity and all the way through early clinical trials. That's true for both Create Bio and for BPM. Uh, and and the, the real distinction between the two is Create Bio is for biologics and BPM is for small molecules. Everything else is relatively similar. Uh, and I will elaborate because there are a few aspects to BPM that do not exist with Create Bio program. But touch on that a bit more in depth further down the line. Uh, and then obviously clinical research, they, they do cover a pretty significant amount of clinical research as well. Um, so starting with IGNITE, uh, the, the main three, the, I guess the most relevant three programs they have at this time are assay development and therapeutic agent identification and characterization to support therapeutic discovery. Uh, pharmacodynamics and in vivo efficacy studies for small molecules and biologics or biologic, biotechnology products, and development and validation of model systems and or pharmacodynamic, pharmacodynamic markers to facilitate the discovery of neurotherapeutics. That was a mouthful. Um, basically, these are the three most relevant programs they have currently that are open, and I'll touch on all three of them in a bit more depth right now. So starting with the assay development uh, and therapeutic identification project program, um, this is, all three of these are R21, R33s. Uh, what that means is it's a phased grant. There's an R21 phase and an R33 phase. Similar in many ways to what you may know from SBIR programs, where there's an SBIR phase one and SBIR phase two. Um, this is not like the SBAR in the sense that you can apply separately for a phase one, conduct the research, and then apply for the phase two. You apply for this, it's kind of like a fast track SBAR. You apply for it, either you get them both or you don't. Um, you receive the funding for the R21 phase, and if you complete it successfully, you receive the funding for the R33 phase. Uh, in total, the cost here can be about 700, up to about $750,000. And basically, this specific mechanism is designed to support development of in vitro or ex vivo assays uh, towards screening and various different other um, ways, basically to, to characterize uh, and identify therapeutic agents, uh, obviously, that are relevant for the goals of the NIDS, so neurological disorders. Um, the next deadline is October 16th, so that's pretty soon. Um, uh, and it's a fantastic opportunity if this is obviously a fit for what you do. Um, if it's not, I'm pretty sure we'll find something that is in a few minutes. Um, let me just... Here we go. Perfect. Uh, so the pharmacodynamics and in vivo efficacy studies uh, for small molecules and biologics or biotechnology products is a very similar funding mechanism. Also an R21, R33, same budget cap of three quarters of a million dollars, um, same deadline, and basically the main difference is this one would not cover assay development, but pharmacodynamic and in vivo efficacy studies. Uh, that basically is, is the difference, and if this is what you're doing, then 
essentially same deadline, same budget, but submit through this mechanism. And then there's a third one. Um, again, same budget. This one has a slightly different deadline, October 18th. Uh, again, an R21, R33. Um, and this is for development and validation of model systems or pharmacodynamic markers. Um, so basically, if uh, we're talking about, it could be either animal models and human tissue ex vivo systems or uh, pharmacodynamic markers. Uh, either two can be submitted through this mechanism. And, and as I mentioned, the deadline is right around the corner. You have two extra days here, but still, it's, it's, you know, it's, we're talking about, I think, about five or six weeks from now. So you should, if this is a good fit, you should definitely get going. Um, a bit further down the line in terms of development, as I mentioned, there are the Create Bio and the BPN uh, programs. I'll start with the Create Bio, and basically, uh, this is taken from their website, this kind of infographic of, of what the mechanisms are and what they cover. Basically, they have an optimization track that is de designed to take validated targets uh, and optimize them towards the IND enabling studies. And they have the development track, which is designed to take optimized leads and move them into the clinic or even through phase one, really depending on the situation. Um, and we'll touch on the specific mechanism in a second, but an uh, important uh, thing to, to, to mention here is this entire program to create bio is only for biologics. Um, and basic, basically, uh, that is defined, and you can see it here at the bottom paragraph, I added uh, peptides, proteins, oligonucleotides, gene therapies, cell therapies, or uh, novel emerging modalities. So essentially, uh, this is a U01. Um, U01, and uh, maybe this is a good point to, to elaborate a bit on what the U mechanisms are in general, because we're, we'll be discussing quite a few in, in kind of... In general, the NINDS, a few years ago, I think it was 2014, they, at the time, they called it a paradigm shift. I think uh, it's a bit strong phrasing, but uh, basically, they changed the funding mechanisms they used to fund most of the R&D that they fund. No longer the standard R21, R01, and that's it, and SBARs. Um, one of the most prevalent types of mechanisms, because there are a few different types of, of U mechanisms, but as a type of mechanism, the main difference between the R mechanisms and the U mechanisms is that U mechanisms are collaborative, meaning basically it's it's the NIH with the company. Now it's don't don't be deterred by that. It, it, they're a bit more hands-on than with your standard grant that just give you the money and, and ask you you know at the end of every year what you did. Uh, but they're not making decisions for you. It's more about being part of the process and not forcing your hands. Um, the, you'll see in a minute that there are some pretty high dollar amounts attached to a lot of these grants, and they just want to be um, in the loop and, and able to, to understand what's happening, not in retrospect after you've spent the money, but during the process. That, that's the main difference. Uh, a lot of our clients have actually found this type of mechanism and that type of input from, from the funding agencies, in this case, obviously, the NIH, to, to be very beneficial. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't view that as a deterrent. At least I don't, I don't think you should. Um, but generally speaking, a lot of these mechanisms are U mechanisms. Um, in this specific case, we're talking about the optimization track. Uh, and, and there are two mechanisms for the optimization track. One is a U01, and this is the one we're discussing right now. And in, in a minute, you'll see they also have an SBIR counterpart, which is a very similar mechanism, but it's not a U01, it's a U44, which is a collaborative SBIR. And I'll touch on that in a second. But generally speaking, uh, the funding in this case is not capped. So basically, ask for something that makes sense and what you know, is a realistic reflection of what the costs of the research are going to be. But there's no specific number. They won't say nothing over, I don't know, 3.5 million uh, is acceptable. If they like it and the cost makes sense, they'll fund it. Um, deadline, February 13th. Uh, and we're talking again about the optimization track, meaning taking validated leads uh, and optimizing them towards going into IND enabling studies. Um, similar mechanism here, as I mentioned, the SBAR counterpart to this mechanism. Um, 
is a U44. Uh, this one does have a budget cap. All SBARs have budget caps. Um, but on the other hand, it's a very high dollar amount for an SBAR. It's $5.4 million. Um, and and the, the scope of the research that uh, it would cover is, is pretty much identical. Uh, the main difference is this is only small businesses. So it's a bit less competitive. So in, there are some, to, some exceptions to this, but in most cases, a small business would be um, better off submitting through this mechanism and not the U1. Although it depends on collaborations and, and various other aspects. So that is definitely a generalization. Uh, deadline again, February 13th. And um, that's pretty much it. It's, it's, it's you don't you don't come across SBARs that would fund five and a half million dollars every day. So it's definitely worth looking into. Um, this is an interesting mechanism, and this is, by the way, uh, the development track, uh, the more advanced track, taking um, basically uh, leads that have been optimized and moving them into IND enabling studies and early clinical trials. Um, Specifically, these uh, these mechanisms expired. The last deadline was about a month ago, and they haven't been issued yet for next year. We're expecting that to happen soon. And if everything happens on course, the first deadline should be February. Um, there have been some delays, so it's not 100 percent. Nothing is 100 percent until it's issued. Uh, but generally speaking, you should be looking at a deadline in Q1 of next year. The budget cap, uh, maybe before the budget cap, a UH2, UH3 is also phased. It's also um, a, a, a collaborative agreement uh, type of mechanism. So essentially, it's a U mechanism, and it's there are two phases, UH2, UH3. Um, and basically, this, you, you can see with the dollar on $7.25 million, this is taking you through some some of the more expensive stages of development, IND enabling studies, early clinical trials, fantastic opportunity. Um, if this is where you're positioned, and I assume a lot of the people listening in are positioned somewhere along these lines, um, really great mechanism. You, you can come in um, pretty much, you know, early preclinical, even mid preclinical, anywhere you are. Obviously not, you know, middle of uh, phase two clinical trial and not uh, hit to lead, but anywhere kind of in the realm that we discussed, um, if you have something that is of interest to the NIDS, this could be a great mechanism. And, and the other uh, option here, again, in terms of the funding mechanism, um, is the SBAR counterpart. Uh, again, same issue here with the deadline, but we don't know exactly when that will be yet. Uh, again, IND enabling studies, early phase clinical trials. Uh, and, and basically, the main difference here is A, it's an SBAR, so it's only small businesses, and B, the budget on the SBAR uh, mechanism is a bit lower. This is 6.5 million, uh, in contrast to 7.25 for the UH2, UH3. Okay, the BPN. Uh, also part of the NINDS, uh, uh, and basically the, the BPN, the, the Blue Planet Neurotherapeutics Network, uh, is a network that provides both funding and support that is not necessarily funding for development of small molecules that are you know, of interest to the NINDS. So it could be funding, it could be access to CROs that are NIH funded, it could be access to consultants that they would hire for you. Um, so, so the fantastic set of mechanisms they have here, and, and one of the important things to mention, and this is true for all the BPN mechanisms, um, you don't have to submit in your budget anything that's covered by the CRO or consultants. Uh, if you know if the budget cap is X dollars, that's X dollars to be given to you, not the reflection of the costs of the CRO's work or anything that's outsourced or the consultants. That's covered and it's not part of your budget. So the budget cap applies only to the funds you actually receive. Um, and, and the main mechanism here, there are again two versions of it. There's a U44, which is a, a collaborative uh, fast track SBAR again, uh, or a UG3, UH3, um, which is 
in many ways similar, but it's not an SPI now. Uh, and basically, they start, they'll pick you up from hit to lead chem speed and all the way through phase one clinical testing. Um, and the mechanism here, the first one is the SBIR, uh, $6.5 million again. We're, we're, we're looking at some high dollar amount SBIRs today. Uh, definitely not your run of the mill uh, 1.5 million phase two. And basically, first of all, the deadline here is February 6th. Uh, and this essentially can be anything that, as I mentioned, encourages applications from small businesses seeking to support and advance their small molecule drug discovery and development projects into the clinic. It's that broad. Um, anything that's of interest to the NINDS, it is a small molecule, and it is, as it, it is at that stage of development, which is relatively broad again, um, could be submitted through here. So, so essentially, the main distinction is small molecules. Um, and as they mentioned, projects can enter at the discovery stage or uh, at development stage. Either way is fine. In this case, unlike the Create Bio, where there were separate mechanisms, uh, and it would just, you know, obviously affect the budget that you asked for. But uh, you could you could go either way. And then the counterpart to this funding mechanism is the UG3 UH3, very similar, just not an SBAR. February seventh. Um, this one has no budget cap, but obviously, again, and this is always true for pretty much any funding mechanism, even when there's no budget cap, the budget should reflect the actual needs. Um, that aside, this is pretty much identical to the previous one, so I won't elaborate on it, um, but it's in many cases either because of the budget that is not capped on the SBAR, or maybe you have various collaborators that would make this make more sense maybe you're not SBA or eligible. So there are various reasons to use this and not the other one, but either way, both of them are out there. and Both of them are accessible. Um, before I go into the clinical trial funding, I wanted to mention something that the NINBS has as well, which is paired solicitation. And this is going back to the kind of standard, more, I don't know, old fashioned is the right way to say it, because most funding mechanisms still heavily use the R21 and R1, unlike the NINBS. Um, but they have paired solicitation, which meaning a, tip, a topic that's of interest to them. They'll, they'll publish an R21 and an R01. Same topics, same, pretty much everything focus. Uh, the only difference would be the scope of the funding and the stage of development they would ask you to be at. And obviously the preliminary data that's required, which is a reflection of that. Um, so I, I brought three examples here, but they're not the only ones. So there's a neurology, neurobiology of migraine, so there's an R21 and an R01, depending on how developed your project is. Research on autism spectrum disorders, drug discovery for nervous system disorders, various different subjects. They have this type of situation where if you're at a very early stage, technically an R21 can be submitted with no preliminary data. We don't suggest that at all, uh, but it is possible uh, in terms of how early they would go and, and what they would consider funding. Um, and then an R1 is obviously for more advanced research. Um, moving forward, uh, there's a lot of funding available in, in the neurospace for clinical trials as well. One, in terms of raising non dilutive funding for clinical trials, one of the best spaces to be in um, in, in the life sciences. I, I can easily say neurosciences and infectious diseases are the two spaces in which funding clinical trials through grants is very realistic. It's not impossible in various other uh, sectors of, of, of our uh, industry, but those two, are, uh, there's really a, a, a true focus on it within the funding agencies. That aside, I'm not going to go, in, not going to go into every single funding mechanism I've listed here, but I, I just want to illustrate that there are a lot of funding mechanisms, and I think you'll see the word clinical in, in the title of each and every one of these. So if you are in the neurospace and you're looking to fund a clinical trials, a clinical trial, or clinical trials actually, um, pause, either give us a call, send us an email, or, or look into it yourself. There is money out there for clinical trials. As a general rule of thumb, pretty much none of these mechanisms have a budget cap besides the SBARs, but the budget cap there is relatively high. Um, so we're talking about multi-million dollar awards. 
uh, it's definitely worth looking at. Another source of funding that could be relevant for uh, various specific indications, uh, because what, what everything I discussed up until this point, because of the, the NIH that has a very broad interest in neurosciences, uh, was pretty much, I, I wasn't you know, discussing specific indications. That's not necessarily true for the DOD. The DOD are interested in, in specific indications that are of interest to them. Uh, and, and they have a mechanism um, through the USAMRMC, the United States Army Medical Research and Materials Command, um, a broad agency announcement that's basically issued every year uh, in October, open year round, there are no deadlines. You submit a pre application, hopefully that's fairly reviewed, and then they give you a deadline for the full application. Uh, typically about 90 days after they let you know. Um, uh, so there's no single deadline here. There's also no budget cap on this. And basically, you have to be a fit for one of the uh, programs they have in one of the focus areas. So basically, TBI, spinal cord injuries, and PTSD, in terms of what we're discussing today, are all things that could be relevant to them for obvious reasons. Um, so if you're positioned in one of these areas, definitely look into the USA MRMC broad agency announcement. It could be an additional source of funding. And one of the great things about submitting here is, first of all, obviously, there's no deadlines, no budget cap, which are two fantastic things. It's very useful not to have a specific deadline. And I don't really think I need to explain why not having a budget cap is positive. But um, this basically gives you another source. You can, you can send not obviously the exact same application because the different, they have different formats and they have different ways that you would have to go about doing it. But the same scientific activities, you can't submit the same set of activities twice to the NIH. You can't submit it though once to the NIH and once to the DOD, the exact same set of activities. So this could be a very good way to kind of multiplex and increase your chances of getting that set of activities awarded by submitting it to more than one source of funding. Um, And this is, I think this is pretty much, every, I've covered everything here. Um, this is the funding in, uh, information on, on the broad agency announcement I just mentioned. Um, if, you, if you're Googling it, you could use the W81XWH17RPA1 number that'll find it very quickly. Uh, I don't know if there are many things that have that title out there on the internet. Um, and in general, this is, this is the information you need. Um, in terms of private foundations that could be relevant for this type of funding, uh, or rather in this area of research, uh, so there are two main ones, the MJFF and, and, and ADDF. Uh, Michael J. Fox Foundation, obviously Parkinson's research. Uh, they have three uh, funding, open, uh, funding opportunities, uh, target advancement, therapeutic development, and outcome measures. There's some information here on, on what each one of those would actually cover. The deadline for all three is September 27th. So if you have not, um, they have, I, if I remember, right, four deadlines a year. So it's not the end of the world if it's, uh, no, that's actually ADDF. Uh, they don't, they have three. But anyway, um, if you haven't started working on it, either get going right now or, or wait for the next deadline. But, but there are some great funding opportunities from, from the Michael J. Fox Foundation as well. Uh, and the ADDF um, is, is the funding agency I mentioned earlier that has four deadlines a year. So if uh, you're not able to hit November 17th with the letter of intent, then they're pretty much every three months is another cycle here. Uh, but in general, they have four funding opportunities, preclinical drug discovery, biomarkers development, uh, prevention beyond the pipeline, and program to accelerate clinical trial, which is will fund up, up to $3 million. So it's not, that, that's not an insignificant uh, award there for the clinical trials. Uh, definitely worth looking into if, obviously, you're in the Alzheimer's space. Um, those are pretty much the funding opportunities that I wanted to cover today. Um, to give you a little insight in terms of how you should present an application, and, and really in light of how it's reviewed. So basically, Keeping in mind what they're looking for, in our opinion, is something that is always very helpful in, in, in thinking of how to put together an application. 
And basically, and this is taken from the NIH, uh, the review criteria here are the NIH's review criteria, but this stands true for pretty much any source of funding regardless. We're looking at leadership, environment, significance, innovation, and above all, a top-notch scientific approach. You need to have the proper leadership and environment and innovation, and it has to be significant, obviously. Uh, but what will really determine if you're going to be awarded or not, because there are a lot of applications that have the necessary leadership and environment, etc., is your scientific approach. And it's essentially a risk uh, management, a risk evaluation process where they're weighing uh, the pros against the cons, the strengths of your project against the risks of what if this doesn't work, what if it goes wrong, and not only presenting your strengths in the right way and, and the significance and the importance and the, and the unmet medical need, but also conveying that you have a plan for what if this happens, what if that happens. Um, very important things to give them an understanding that, I mean, they're not investors, they're not looking for a return on their investment, but they have a finite amount of funds and they want to get the best results. So in many ways, they're still weighing the risks of failure in a very, with a different, very different perspective, but still in, in similar ways to an investor, they're still looking to see where possible failures may be and, and if it's a good idea or, or, or maybe there are better ideas to, in terms of, of where they should allocate their funds. Um, the way we approach it is turning non diluted funding into a real strategic source of funding, not replacing angels or VC or obviously public markets, um, but adding that into the mix and, 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 and making sure that it's not something that's neglected. Because that just kind of as an anecdote, if you look at what's currently available in the United States annually, from the sources of non diluted funding, which is about $50 billion, taking the NIH and the DOD and the other sources of funding, kind of grouping that together, that's more than the entire VC community put together. Um, and that's something that, that kind of flies under the radar in, in many respects. Uh, and, and we don't think it should, and, and, and hopefully we're <laughs> able to, to bring that message across. Um, we have a systematic approach. Uh, we conduct a thorough strategic assessment for any of our clients' projects, making sure we outline everything that could be relevant for any of the activities they're looking to fund. Uh, we obviously align that with the, the trends and the interests of the funding agencies. Uh, and we correlate the strategy that we create in terms of what would be submitted where and when, obviously with your R&D plan. Um, well, obviously work around uh, targeting the right mechanism, uh, making sure it's fit for what they're looking for, fit for what you're looking for as well, by the way, submitting an application because it's a good fit for what they're looking for, even though it's not really what you want to do with your technology is not necessarily a good idea at all. Uh, so it's really making kind of everything match and, and creating a strategy out of all the data. Um, and, and basically we create a multi-submission granting strategy, a long-term plan of everything that would be submitted, and then we start acting on it. Um, lowering the risks, knowing your weaknesses, finding the right partners when necessary. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, aligning that with the interests of the funding agencies. Um, and, and really kind of essentially streamlining the whole process and making sure that you produce both as many applications as possible and make sure each one of those applications is truly a top-notch application and that has truly been maximized in terms of the chances of it actually being awarded. Um, and that's, this is pretty much a summary of, uh, of exactly what I said. Um, and that's it. Um, at this time, I'd like to take some questions. So I'll, I'll be looking at the questions tab. Anybody that has entered a question or that wants to now is more than welcome to. So there's a question about, are these NIH programs exclusive to USA applicants? Uh, and specifically here asking about the UK, but the answer here is, is very general. There are some, namely the SBIR mechanisms, would all be um, for US organizations, but most of the other mechanisms that are non sbars have no geographical restrictions. Um, and, and as you probably noticed, uh, pretty much everything had an SBAR counterpart and a non-SBAR counterpart. So with very few uh, exceptions, 
any organization anywhere in the world can submit to the non-SBAR mechanism. Um, let me see here. So there are a few companies that are very, yeah, excuse me, questions that are very similar. I hope I answered all of those. So just to, just, just to clarify, you most definitely can submit the same set of activities to the NIH and to the DOD. You cannot submit the same set of activities twice to the same source of funding. You most definitely can submit it to two separate sources of funding. Um, there's some questions here about our service, which I'm more than happy to discuss, but I won't necessarily open that up as part of the webinar. Um, so there are a couple questions here that are very specific, and I'm happy to address those via email, but I don't think there's a need to really uh, uh, kind of broadcast this um, uh, and have it on our YouTube channel. Uh, let's see here. Okay, I think that's it for now. Uh, I'm happy to address any of the additional questions that I did not have time to address uh, via email. As I mentioned, I will be sending you uh, both the, the deck and the link to the recording on YouTube. Uh, so feel free to reply to that email and ask me any additional questions uh, if they arise. Thank you very much for attending today, uh, and we look forward to seeing you in our west next webinar, which, as I mentioned, is October 3rd on medical devices uh, and non-legal funding for them, trends, and opportunities. Thank you very much.